All right, now that we've learned about the three types of covalent intermolecular forces, um, we're going to turn to, well, how's the AP going to ask you questions about this? And you'll see that as you see uh, more and more examples, it becomes much more obvious about how to tackle them. But having a strategy is really important. So we're going to give you a really specific strategy today. Now, what do these questions look like? Well, often they're giving you real world data. In other words, they'll give you some boiling points in a table or maybe um, some uh, melting points or something like that. And they'll ask you to justify why one is higher than the other based on your understanding of intermolecular forces. Uh, it can be easy to um, know the answer here, but not be able to express it quite clearly enough. So tip number one, which I'm not gonna put on the screen, but is super important. Students often misuse bond, intermolecular force, and it seems surprising, but atom and molecule. Be clear about what you're talking about. Are you talking about attracting an atom, a molecule? Be specific in your wording. If you mean electron, don't say that it's pulling atoms towards it. You mean to say it's pulling electrons towards it. So being specific in your wording is super important. But here's a second tip. AP will often give you counterintuitive examples. And what I mean by that is if you have this sort of hierarchy of hydrogen bonding is the strongest of the intermolecular forces and London dispersion forces is the weakest, you might start to come to the conclusion that it's as simple as if I identify that that particular compound has hydrogen bonding and this one doesn't, that it will always have a higher boiling point. And that is just not true. So what you want to do is you want to clearly identify intermolecular forces, but make sure it's super important, don't ever contradict the data. You don't know better. It's not a, a, a sort of a, a, um, a poor example that they've given you. Um, they're showing you real world data and you should never contradict it. So we're gonna wrap our arguments so that they fit the data, super important. Now we're gonna start, we're gonna do four problems today and we're gonna start with the easiest of them. This one I think is obvious, as in I think it's likely you will know the answer to it immediately and we're just gonna look at, well, how do you craft an argument that will make sense to AP and get you the credit you deserve? And then we're gonna move into those counterintuitive examples a little bit later. All right, so here's my first example. I think it's a pretty easy one. So clearly the boiling point of hydrofluoric acid is higher than hydrochloric acid. They're saying that they're 287K and 192K respectively. Remember, respectively means in that order. So clearly hydrofluoric acid's boiling point is higher and they want us to explain why with our understanding of intermolecular forces. Well, why do you think it has a higher boiling point? Well, when I'm looking at it right now, I know that compounds that have HO, HN, and HF have the opportunity to hydrogen bond, and hydrogen bonding is particularly strong as an intermolecular force. Hydrochloric acid obviously isn't gonna be able to do that. So I think that that's the most important part of this argument. Now we just have to make sure that we phrase it in a way that AP will give us credit for. So what are things that students forget? Well, they focus on the strongest one, like the, their argument will only have to do with hydrofluoric acid or they will start with um, getting into the intermolecular forces before they've drawn the most important and obvious conclusion. You remember, we started this unit having no idea what London dispersion forces were or, or uh, dipole-dipole forces were. And even at that time, we could tell which one of these compounds had stronger intermolecular forces. We would have said that because the boiling point of hydrofluoric acid is higher, it must have stronger intermolecular forces. So that's where we're going to start. Don't dig into what kinds of forces they have first. Start with just, based on the data, which one must have stronger intermolecular forces. Now I'm going to encourage you to make your arguments in a bullet-pointed fashion. Just because AP calls this kind of work an essay question doesn't mean you have to write in paragraph form, but you do need to write in complete sentences, like a couple of utterances won't work. It has to be complete sentences. And so I'm gonna show you a model in just a minute. After we draw this conclusion, so yep, we know that 287, hydrofluoric acid has stronger intermolecular forces. Then we get into why. And we need to identify all of the intermolecular forces between uh, compounds for both HF, H, and HCl, not just one. And then lastly, my pro tip is, use the phrase between molecules as much as you possibly can. 
AP believes that students don't really know the difference between an intermolecular force and a bond. So if you show any confusion about that, they'll take credit away. Now that might drive some of you crazy if you understand that intermolecular means between molecules. So why am I going to use this between molecules phrase a lot? It's because I don't want any confusion with the readers at the AP uh, reading. All right, so let's look at an example. We've got HF. We know that hydrogen uh, HF, because it has a fluorine and a hydrogen, and it has a lone pair if we drew out its Lewis structure, it can definitely do hydrogen bonding. Anything that can do hydrogen bonding is polar and therefore can do dipole-dipole interactions. And everything, as long as it has electrons, can do London dispersion forces. Now, if we identify the intermolecular forces in HCl, they are dipole-dipole forces because it's polar, right? The dipole pulls towards chlorine. And, of course, it can do London dispersion forces because all molecules with electrons can do that. So now we have to wrap it up into an argument and watch how the argument goes. First thing, do not get into what kind of forces they have. Don't just make a list on the side. You need to write it out in sentence form. So watch this. I'm going to ignore these forces. Hydrofluoric acid has a higher boiling point. I cited the data. Therefore, must have stronger intermolecular forces. Cite the data. They gave you data. You need to cite it. And you notice I'm not digging in there. I'm just saying uh, which one must have stronger intermolecular forces. Because that in and of itself will give you credit a lot of times. Step two, dig into those intermolecular forces. HF has hydrogen bonding, dipole-dipole, and London dispersion forces between its molecules. See, there it is. I don't want them to think that I think those forces are in the molecule. It's between the molecules. While HCl only has dipole-dipole and London dispersion forces. So I talked about both of them. That's the second requirement. And now in step three, we have to say, well, why is it that hydrofluoric acid has a higher boiling point? Well, clearly it's because of that hydrogen bonding, right? The larger dipole between hydrogen and fluoride results in a greater hydrogen bond intermolecular force between HF molecules than the dipole-dipole intermolecular force between HCl. I decided it was the difference in the strongest intermolecular forces that was the key here, and I explained why. So step one, just which is stronger? Step two, what forces do they have? Step three, dig into the why. So that's one example. Now let's look at some that get a little bit harder. Let's try this one out. Ethanol has more surface tension than acetone. Justify this in terms of intermolecular forces. Now this is an example that when you dig into the types of forces, you probably want to make sure you have a good idea of the Lewis structure and you might want to use our new uh, large molecule Lewis structure drawing uh, uh, skills because these have nothing but carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. But we're not even going to go there first. Let's start with one. Based on the data, which compound do you believe has the stronger intermolecular force? Well, since ethanol has higher surface tension, that means it has stronger intermolecular forces. That's going to be our first statement. We're not even going to dig into the types of intermolecular forces. Now, to dig into the intermolecular forces, I've got to know, can they hydrogen bond? Can they do dipole-dipole interactions? Hydrogen bonding we need the structure for, but even dipole-dipole interactions we need a structure for too because we need to know if they're polar or not. So there's the structure of ethanol. Is that what you got when you, you drew it out using your new organic drawing skills? Acetone, I think the carbon and the hydrogens are together and the oxygen is next to it, and that oxygen has a double bond. So that's what it looks like. All right, so let's go back to ethanol. Ethanol clearly can hydrogen bond. It has an OH and it has a lone pair. It can hydrogen bond with itself. And you know if it has that, it has all the others as well. It's polar, all that kind of stuff. This one cannot hydrogen bond. So right there, I think it might be weaker. But what can it do? Can it do dipole-dipole interactions? Well, if it's polar, yes, it can. Now, I see three electron groups. That means it's trigonal planar, and I think that drawing is pretty good. The bond angles are 120 degrees. Where are their bond dipoles? Well, I'm going to draw them in. Let me get my little pen out. I'm gonna, oh, I already have a pen out. Um, I think carbon is more electronegative than hydrogen. Nah, it's pretty close. Let's just leave it off. It's pretty close. Oxygen is definitely more electronegative than carbon. So since these don't have much of a dipole, there's going to be a net dipole. It is polar, so therefore... Yes, we would expect it to have, ooh, no, that's wrong. I must have changed the example. No hydrogen bonding. Yes on the dipole-dipole. 
yes on the London dispersion forces because it was polar. So does this match? This one has more forces and a much stronger force. Yes, it had more surface tension. So I don't think this is one of those counterintuitive tricky ones either. Let's look at how we might make the argument. Well, ooh, I fixed it here. Well, first, don't wade into these things. Just say ethanol has higher surface tension. I cited the data and therefore must have stronger intermolecular forces between its molecules than methanol. There it is. You see that? Between its molecules. Two, let's dig into the intermolecular forces. We're just going to list them. We're not going to explain why, but we're going to list them. Ethanol molecules have hydrogen bonding, dipole-dipole, and London dispersion forces between their molecules. There it is again. While acetone only had dipole-dipole and London dispersion forces between its molecules. Okay, why did that result in the data we saw? Well, the combined intermolecular forces between ethanol molecules are greater than between uh, acetone molecules because of the additional strong hydrogen bond intermolecular force. There we go. We've concluded the data, we listed the, the, the intermolecular forces, and we explained why. This is looking pretty easy. Now let's get to one that might not seem so intuitive. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to write down, stop, we're going to stop the video here, and I want you to write out your argument. Okay, let's see what we've got. Well, for starters, the data is here. Let's see if we conclude, conclude before we get into the types of intermolecular forces, what's going on. I think carbon tetrachloride has a higher boiling point, and that indicates that it has stronger intermolecular forces. All right, we got step one done. So even if we're wrong about everything after this, you notice that we have not contradicted the data. And I have a feeling some of you out there are feeling like this data is wrong, and it's not. I looked it up. So where do we go from there? Now we have to identify the types of intermolecular forces. Well, I don't even want to attempt to do that without a Lewis structure, because while I'm pretty certain that neither one of these can hydrogen bond, my hydrogen bond is going to be out. No O and H, no N and H, no F and H in either one of these. That's out. But if I want to know if it's dipole-dipole, I need to know the Lewis structure. Well, here's the Lewis structure of carbon tetrachloride. I counted the valence electrons, spread them around the outside, when, then went to the inside. That's not true. I just looked them up on the internet. But you're going, to, you're going to write them out. Sulfur dioxide, if I do the same thing, I get this. Now, remember, Lewis structures don't necessarily show shape. So let's see, what shape would we think this would be? How many electron groups do you see? I see four, so I think it's tetrahedral in its shape. Well, if it's tetrahedral in its shape and all of these are chlorines, that means that those bond dipoles are going to cancel. This thing is nonpolar. And if it's nonpolar, what's the only intermolecular force it can have? That's right, it has London dispersion forces. That's it. Now let's look at SO2. SO2 has one, two, three electron groups. I think it's going to look trigonal planar with those 120 degree bond angles. Where that's a lone pair, where there's no pull up there, <clears throat> this is an oxygen pulling that way, that's an oxygen pulling that way. Will those bond dipoles offset? No, they will not. They're not going in opposite directions. They will not offset. So you're going to get a net dipole down. I think this end is going to be partially negative. That end is going to be partially positive. It is polar, which means what types of hydrogen or, uh, intermolecular forces does it have? Definitely dipole-dipole forces, because it's polar, and all compounds that have electrons have London dispersion forces, because they have those polarizable electrons, right? Okay, we've got it figured out. Now, let's see. Before we go on and make our argument, let's see if this makes sense. Based on this, which of these two do you believe would have the higher boiling point? Wouldn't you think this one? Dipole-dipole forces are stronger than London dispersion forces. But when I look over here at the data, the boiling point of carbon tetrachloride is higher. I wonder why that is. It must mean that this intermolecular force is stronger than these two intermolecular forces combined. Why? Well, I suspect that this one's London dispersion force is super strong because chlorine has a lot of electrons in it. Each one has 17 electrons. That doesn't even include the carbon. These have fewer electrons. So more electrons, more electrons that are further out from the nucleus, because chlorine's a pretty big atom, 
means that it has more polarizable electrons and therefore stronger London dispersion forces than this one does. So this is an example of a counterintuitive example. Now I'm not going to ignore the dipole-dipole here, I'm just going to list it. Watch this. So one, I don't even get into the types of intermolecular forces. Carbon tetrachloride has a higher boiling point and therefore must have stronger intermolecular forces between its molecules and SO2. Boom! I probably got some credit there not knowing anything about intermolecular forces. Step two, I'm just going to list them. Carbon tetrachloride has London dispersion forces between molecules, while SO2 has dipole-dipole uh, and London dispersion forces. Notice, between molecules, between molecules, use it as much as you can. Now let's get to our conclusion. I don't argue with the data. The combined intermolecular forces between carbon tetrachloride molecules are greater, that's what the data said, than those between SO2 molecules because of the greater number of electrons in carbon tetrachloride, which I could say greater number of polarized electrons would be better, and that leads to very strong London dispersion forces. So that's our first example with a counterintuitive example. But you notice, don't argue with the data.